Everybody had a good nap today? Huh? Who did? You had one? I don't believe that. I've never known you to sleep, ever. Galatians 5. You had a nap? Uriah, you had a nap? Jaden, you, or Liam, you had one? Michaela had a nap? Man, I don't think I, I must not have given you enough candy then. I know it, but if I'd have given you more candy, you probably wouldn't have been able to have one. And boy, I got a bunch in there too. And they had, see, it doesn't do me good to go into salvage grocery stores. Because I'm looking at it going, look at the price on that. And Lisa's going, what do we need that for? But look at the price on it. You can't get that that cheap anywhere. And she says, but we don't eat that. But look at that. We can't leave that here. That's a good price. And I do. I just want to go, look at that. That's a good price on that. That's cheap too. And Yeah. But when I saw the candy, the packages of Snickers, Snickers minis there, I'm just going, that's a really good price on those. They're like $1.80 a bag, and if those at Walmart, they're like seven or eight bucks. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't pass it up. And my grandkids love me now. Galatians 5.22, we've been talking about the works of the flesh and we have i mean just if you look at that list of the works of the flesh and this is what i tell people adultery fornication uncleanness lascivious who doesn't who doesn't have that in them or had that at one time in them idolatry witchcraft hatred variance emulations wrath strife seditions heresies i mean that's in us envyings murders drunkenness revelings and such like. I mean, that list covers every sin that every church member has committed. Okay? It covers it all. And so, we have that as part of our flesh. So, they that commit such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So, we know then that this body is not going to inherit the kingdom of God because we have done those things. So then, the goal of every born-again Christian, what should be in, in the sincerity of our heart, is that we want ourselves separated from this, this body of flesh, this flesh that we have. I don't want it to live long. I mean, God may have that in store for me, but we don't want it to, we don't want it, well, how, what am I trying to say? We want to give this body as little time as possible to do what it's going to do. After that, we want it separate, we want it cast off, we want it taken off, so that what's, what's really on the inside of us, that which is born of God, can prosper. So, the fruit of the Spirit Verse 22, it's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Father in heaven, we pray, dear God, that you would bless the message this morning as it, uh, as it reverberates in our heart. Thank you, Lord, for the Messages and phone calls received today, Lord, of those who uh, have said that the message reached them and it's, there's something that they're battling right now in their life. They're struggling with hatred, hatefulness. It is part of our flesh. And so, Father, I'm thankful, God, that uh, you allowed the message to reach into lives and touch people and convict us, Father, when it's necessary because 
Lord, you know just how much of these things is actually in us. And Father, what, what one may be dealing with out of this list of 18 things that's in our flesh, what one of us may be dealing with may not be an issue with others, but something else in that list will be. And so, Father, help us to understand, God, that each one of us in this church, each one of those that are with us online, Lord, every one of these things is going to touch one or another of us. And so, Father, help us to keep that in mind. Help us to love one another and be patient and kind, forbearing, long-suffering with one another and help to bear one another's burdens. So, Father, we just pray, dear God, that all things would be said and done in love, the intention of Christian fellowship and Christian growth. And Father, we thank you for the gifts of the Spirit. These gifts are free, as all gifts are. And so, Father, we just pray our sincerest desire, God, as your saints, is that these things would be manifested in our lives. Lord, we spent years living for the devil and letting these works of the flesh, that's what we were known by. We were either known as drunkards, we were known as haters, we were known as fornicators. Father, help us now to be known by these gifts of the Spirit. Help people to see the real fruit of our lives. And Father, bless that fruit. Make us fruitful for your kingdom's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. So, this list, love, first thing on the list, love. So we're going to t- touch on that tonight. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Nine things here. This is the ninth book of the New Testament. It's the number nine. That, that, the number nine means fruit-bearing. Genesis 9, first thing out of God's mouth was, be fruitful and multiply. That's the first thing he said. Genesis 9. Nine is a number, women know this because they carry in their bodies for nine months a child. Then they give birth. They are, give, they are bearing the fruit uh, of what was conceived in them. So nine, that number nine, it, that's what that means. Now, the question is, since we have all of this hate in us, hate and hatefulness, how then do we get love put in us? How then... Can, instead of us manifesting hate to the people that we hate, how can we then turn and manifest love to people that we hate? How can that happen? Huh? Conviction. Be convicted about it. That was the purpose of me preaching it this morning, is to convict those that the Holy Ghost wanted to convict about the hatred or the hatefulness that's in them. So that's where it starts. Huh? It's through the Spirit, right? But how do we get it? Who, what? Turn to John 15. San Juan 15. I've been, we were looking at my Spanish Bible today. And so I've decided I'm going to learn Spanish by reading the Spanish Bible and comparing it with King James. Because that's how some, if you remember Pastor Rock from India, he did not know English. He did, and he speaks good English, but he did not know a word of English, and he decided he was going to learn English, so he got the Hindu Bible and a King James Bible and taught himself English out of the Bible. And I'm going, that's not bad. So anyway, John, John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Now remember, we're dealing with fruit. This is how it works. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So, it's very clear. You refuse to manifest these gifts of the Spirit. You're not saved. That's it. You're not going to heaven. Because if God sees the consistency of your life that you're not bearing fruit, he will cut you off, cast you into the fire. Every branch that beareth, fru- that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Isn't that what you do? You've got every guy that owns an orchard, a vineyard. You see a limb not producing. That limb gets cut off because all that limb is doing is sucking out nutrients, water, 
and everything else, taking up space and not producing anything. So the husbandman has the right, cut off the branch that's not doing anything, it's doing no good, get it off. And so what God will do with us, he will purge us. He, God, will get these things out of our life. Am I right on that? So again, I'm going to say to you, I'm going to say to you, and I'm going to say to you here, if you've asked God to deliver you from the manifestation of sin in your life, if God has not done that yet, be patient with God. Because if you ask God to take that out of your life, is God then going to demand of you that you do it first? If you could do it, then you wouldn't have asked God to do it because you wouldn't need to ask God to do it because you would have already done it yourself. Some things, when you get saved, some things were easy to walk away from. It just took almost no effort. You said, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there anymore. I'm not doing, this is not part of my life. I'm done with that. I'm following God. That was simple. Some things, some things I saw my mom struggle with when I was young. I saw her struggle. It didn't click with me then the way it does now, I look back and I saw the growth in her. But there were some things that she couldn't just walk away from that easily. And it took a while. But once God finally convicted her and God dealt with her and God took it out, never come back. Never come back. I remember my dad telling you, Sterling, on the way down to Ron's deer hunt one time, he said to you, and I've just, I want to do cartwheels in the back of that van going down there. Dad said to you, if God hadn't delivered me from drinking beer, I'd be dead today. And I remember that. I'll never forget as long as I live. I did. I want to jump up to do cartwheels back there. I was so happy to hear my dad say that God had to deliver him from drinking his beer. But he did. And once he did, he never went back. So what I'm telling you is, there are some people out there who fake Christianity and they have no intention of ever quitting anything. I get that. But I'm talking to the sincere, honest, good, Bible-believing Christians that have their own struggles in life. God knows it. God has an interest in you, just like you have an interest in yourself. God's desire is to see the fruit bearing and being manifested in your life. That brings God pleasure and happiness. God has as much intention on clearing up and cleaning up your life as you want your life cleaned up. And I promise you, when God, and God always knows when to do it. He knows better than you do how to do this. He's been doing it for thousands of years. One thing at a time. God will pluck this off. God will get to this. God will touch that. God will convict you of this. And when, time, when God is ready, he'll say, we're okay, now we're taking that off. Because now, now you can bear it. And I'm just saying that's how God does it. If you ask God to do it, don't stop asking until he does it. Make sense? Because there are some things only God can do. You know that, and God, trust me, God knows it. God knows it better than you do, okay? So when we, when we say rely on God, rely on God. And it may be one of those things where God is going to leave it in your life long enough to teach you to rely upon God's grace and God's mercy. So that by the time he takes that off, he knows that you're living the life where you trust only in what God does in your life. And you're not going to brag about what you quit and what you don't do no more. You're not going to boast on that because you know you didn't have anything to do with it. God did it. So verse 3, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. you so you were right, Melissa. You were dead. I'm just waiting for somebody to say it. How is it that you get clean? The word that was spoken unto you. The spoken, the reading of God's word, the preaching of God's word, that's what delivers us from being hateful. And if, if anger and hatefulness is an issue in your life, 
then you put yourself in this word and don't let up until you start seeing the fruit manifest in your life that you're desiring. Abide in me and I in you. Abide in me. Jesus is the word. The word is Jesus. So you abide in the word. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch. Watch this now. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You can't. I'm telling you, you can't do it. You cannot make yourself love somebody that you hate. Am I right? Because if you could, then you wouldn't need God. Now God teaches us these things to get us to rely upon Him. We understand and recognize that without God filling my heart with love for somebody, I am not capable of loving them. Not in my flesh, I'm not. And so when God is ready, he will put it in me to love them. Okay? And I, I, can, I can tell you story after story after story of how this works in my life. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. A lot of you know when, when Brady left here, I was bitter about it. I was bitter. And we got into some heated arguments on Facebook in front of everybody. And I finally had to just cut off both of those boys because I had to block them. And that wasn't so they couldn't see what I was saying about them. I had to block them so I couldn't see what they were saying anymore. Because me seeing that, all it did was stir up more bitterness. And I told them that. I was honest about it. I said, guys, I can't handle this. I have to get out of this situation. So I did. And I just prayed and I said, God, please deliver me from this. So about a year after that, Brady sent me a text message. Pastor, I'd like to come sit down and talk with you about all that happened. And when I first got it, it took me all day to respond. And I was very honest with him. I said, thank you for sending me this, and I'm going to be honest with you. Hearing from you stirred up the bitterness. As long as I don't think about you, I'm fine. But now that I'm thinking about you, what it did is stirred up bitterness. And I understand that you're wanting to make this right. But I can't right now. So please, give me time, and I promise you, when I'm ready, I'll let you know. Please don't hold this against me, but understand that I can't do it right now. And he understood that, and so he waited. And he waited. And he waited. And he kept thinking, should I write him? No, he said to give him time. Lisa would say, have you gotten back in touch with Brady yet? No. Well, don't you think you ought to? Yeah, but I can't. And that, I don't remember, it was, it was a few months. I know that, it was a few months. And finally, one day, God said, you're done. And just like that, I'm not bitter anymore. God had to do it. And I knew that. I knew that just going through the motions, I wasn't ready for. And I wasn't going to fake my way through this. God had to deliver me from the bitterness so that when he came over here, we had a great talk. It was great. It was very fulfilling. It was very rewarding. And we left in peace with one another. And I'm completely satisfied. But had, it, had I tried to fake my way through it, it, would, it probably wouldn't have gone as well. I probably would have ended up just saying, you know, you know what you did to me? I, I, and I didn't want to do that because that's not what he wanted. That's not what he was seeking after. And I didn't want that either. So I, it was one of those deals where I knew I had to wait on the Lord. And when the Lord finally brought me out to a place to where I was ready, then I was perfectly fine with it. Okay. So I'm just saying to you, it's got to be God. So back at that verse there, 
uh, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. And so Jesus then became the owner, per se, of my bitterness. He, he, and I knew that he had it in his hand, because that's where I put it, and I left it there. And so when Jesus then was ready to deliver me from that bondage, he delivered me. He literally just, just like that, it was gone. Okay? And I've experienced that before, where instantly you felt something leave, something go away, like a spirit or like a burden just lifted off of your heart. You just knew that that's how God did it. Okay? So, verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. I know what that is, and you know what that is. So, verse 7, if you abide in me, and then here it is. Read it, Melissa, read it out loud. There you go. My words abide in you. Okay? So, what she said was right. How then, if I'm mad at somebody, if I'm angry at somebody, or I'm holding bitterness against them, and, because of, and it's justified because they did do something wrong, can I be delivered from being in bondage to somebody that, that hurt me or that did something to me? The answer is yes. But faking it doesn't do anybody any good. So let's not fake anything. When, when I, I am against the false witnesses who are testifying of false gifts from God. Oh, bless God, I went to the healing service. God delivered me from back disease. The truth of it is, they still hurt. But they have been taught to make positive confessions, which is nothing more than just lying about how you're feeling. When, when, people, when normal people ask other people, how are you feeling, and they say, you know what, I'm really hurting today. That charismatic crowd says, you just destroyed God's ability to heal in your life. Why? Because I told the truth? No, you made a negative confession. I, no, I told the truth. I don't believe that you ought to lie to get God to heal you. If you're not feeling good, you're not feeling good, why lie about it? Because for some reason, lying about it makes God do something. And I don't go for that. That's nonsense. That's hellish doctrine. Okay? If your leg's broke, your leg is broke. There's no lying about having a broken leg or a broken hand. There's no lying about it says, well, in God, I believe in God that it's not broken. But it's broke. You're testifying of something that isn't true. So there's no sense lying about it, no sense trying to go through the motions of it until God does it. But if you will abide in the Word of God, reading it, believing it, thinking of it, letting, letting the man of God preach it to you, if you will abide in that, I promise you, you will bring forth fruit. Turn to Psalm 1. My Bible just went right to it. Psalm 1. That happened while I was at John Uter's. I said, turn your Bible to Deuteronomy 32, and I just went flip, and there it was. And I'm going, I, I probably couldn't do that again for a $50 bill. Psalm 1. Look at Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed, blessed. Bl who, where do blessings come? Lynn, where do blessings come from? God, can you bless yourself? No. Blessing is a salvation word. You want blessings? God is the only one who can give the blessings. And how does God give the blessings? On the basis of grace, through faith alone, period. Do you deserve the blessings? Can you earn the blessings? No. No. A thousand times no. I'll give you an example out of Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33 tells you that let's say that you've been, let's, Lynn, let's say that you went a whole week and didn't sin. Okay? A whole week. Never sinned, never had a bad thought toward anybody, 
didn't say all those cuss words you say. I'm just making stuff up about you, but, okay? You went a whole week, didn't miss church, nothing. Read your Bible every day, and that's, that's all great. And then some guy got in front of you at the bank or at the store. Some lady grabbed the last thing off the shelf, and you were headed for it. And buddy, I mean, it was right there. Okay, so you sinned in thought or deed. Did you know Ezekiel 33 says that in the day that a righteous man transgresses, all his righteousness is gone. So you were good a whole week and you racked up, let's say, a thousand righteousness points with God. The moment you sinned, God struck them all out. Now the score is zero. You have zero righteousness now. So do not try to tell me that you can be righteous enough in order to merit God's blessings because in the moment you sin, he wipes all your righteousness away and now you have none. This is why he said works of righteousness alone are as filthy rags in God's sight. They mean nothing to him. So to say that you got a blessing because you earned it, you're not being honest. And God, you know what you just did? You stole God's blessing. You stole God, you stole from God the blessing and the joy that he should have had by giving you the blessing because you took it upon yourself to get it. And God's not happy about it. God's a jealous God. Amen? He is not going to share his throne with you. Either it's him or it's nothing. So, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in what? The law of the Lord. That's the Bible. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. The rivers of water is the Bible. That's the rivers of water that you plant your life by. And that, see, when you plant it by the rivers of water, your taproot's going to go right for the river. And it's going to draw from that river all the time. It's not going to need to go anywhere else. It's going to get it right from the river. And so, that, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That is a man who has, who has walked away from the world. So you're not looking for good advice from Dr. Phil anymore. Because you don't trust Dr. Phil. You're not looking for anything that this world has to give you. You're drawn to the Bible. You've planted yourself next to the Word of God. You're drawing from the Word of God every day. And, and with that, you know that as long as there's water in that river, your leaves are never going to fade away. Because you're always getting water. And you know that not every day you're going to bring forth fruit, but when it's season, you will. It's just like a woman, she doesn't give birth the night she conceives. Doesn't happen that way. you got to wait nine months for it, but sure enough, it's going to happen. And so this, all this testifies of is that here is a person who believes God. They've, they've decided that the world gives them nothing worth having. And you can tell a person who is still drawing nourishment from the world because the fruit of their life is going to be worldliness. It's always going to show forth that they are getting their nourishment from the world and not from the river of life. The river of life is the Bible. And so you can tell a person who is in the word, they're drawing from the word, they're hearing the word of God preach, they're getting the Holy Ghost teaching them things on the inside, and they will manifest fruit. And the fruit is love. Very first thing he says is love. So the question is, how can I get love for people that I don't love? You get yourself in this Bible. You read it. You let God apply it. You let God bring it manifested in your life. They say, well, you read it, but you've got to live it. If you'll read it, God will live it through you. 
Okay? And I'm telling you, there is very little work involved. Remember, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden's light. And I'm telling you, if you will get your mind and your heart in this book and read it, and God will apply it, God will work it in your life, and it will be the easiest load in the world to carry. I'm telling you, God delivered me from a great burden this week. Literally did. Because I realized something. Okay? And, I, and it's something that I've preached and something I've tried to teach you numerous times. Sometimes the teacher needs to be retaught. And I relearned something this week that I thought I knew and thought I never would have a problem with, and yet there it was again, manifesting itself again. And I had to go back and let the Bible revive things that were already in me at one point that I had forgotten about. That's why you go back and reread stuff in the Bible because you'll forget things and God through the Bible will stir up old things that you once knew at one time. And I told my wife about it. I said, God dealt with me and God relieved me from a burden this way. She knew it was there, okay? Because we had talked about it. So I'm just saying to you, God's word will do things for you that you cannot do. Remember what the Bible says about the Bible for the word of God is quick. What does that mean? What does the word quick mean? Alive. Doesn't mean fast. Doesn't mean you got to read it fast either. If you're a slow reader, don't worry about it. That Bible is alive, and it's just like when you put a seed in enough dirt, it's going to grow. And it's almost. <laughs> when I plant things, I'm the worst at it, but God just finds a way for it to grow. Amen. Okay? That's just how He does it. So, back in, where was we? Let, uh, John 15, you got that, right? How do I manifest love in my life? Get in the Bible. Abide in the Word. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall, you you're going to bring forth fruit. It'll manifest itself. You'll wonder where it came from. It, it's like the, the, when I wrote the very first book, By Divine Order. That stuff started coming out of me it, I, was, I couldn't write it fast enough. I literally could not write that book fast enough. And I read it. I read through the third, first manuscript, first version of it. I reread it, and I just started crying. I said, God, why did you show me that? And God reminded me, Mike, you asked me to. And I went. And I remembered a year back, I was listening to something about the Torah codes which is a bunch of hooey. And I said, God, if your King James Bible is right, then there should be some sort of pattern in it. Would you show it to me? I prayed that prayer one time. And then in a course of a year, God manifested that prayer, that one prayer. God manifested that in the form of, that was the basis of what I know about Bible numbers. Okay? And pfft, Man, it's out there, okay? And Pastor Rock says that in his Bible college, there's two things that's mandatory for them to learn, and that is the relationship to DNA in the Bible and Bible numbers. And he said, Pastor, we're getting that from you. He said, we teach that to every one of our guys that are going through this college. And I went, really? And I thought that was pretty cool. But that's just, that's God manifesting fruit in your life, and you wonder where it came from. It just... It's the word just coming out of you. Amen? Okay? A person who eats a lot of garlic, and I mean a lot of garlic, garlic is going to come out of the pores of their skin. Right? Yep. It does, doesn't it? It just comes out, and you can't stop it. That's the word. That's the power of the word. So, now, we're getting into the, five minutes until five. Now I'm getting into the message. Love is the second greatest commandment. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So again, it's the two commandments that Jesus gave us. Love the Lord and love your God. So, how do I fulfill those two commandments? If you abide in the vine, you will. 
See, the more you read this Bible, the more you love God, don't you? Because you lo- And when you love God, you'll love the Word. Reading the Bible will not be a big pain for you. You'll just love doing it. And I encouraged somebody yesterday, I said, use your background from where God brought you from, knowing that the Bible contains the truth of all the lies that you used to believe, and, and take that now and go read the Bible and ask God to show you some of the things that you used to study and be part of, to ask God to show you the reality of it in the Scriptures. I said, let that draw you in. Let, the Bible is a treasure chest. And some of the treasures are right on top, but some of them you got to dig for. But I promise you, what you pull out will be worth the dig. Do you believe that? Say amen. And then, John 15, 10, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments. Do not let the Hebrew roots people tell you that you must keep the Ten Commandments. That is not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if, he said, if you keep my commandments... Well, his commandments are, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. And he said, as I kept my father's commandments. His father's commandments were the Ten Commandments, the Torah. Jesus kept and was a fulfillment of the law. He said, as I kept my father's commandments, so you keep my commandments. And my commandments, my commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. They're they're not hard to do. You find out. That when you love somebody, it's easy to love them. If you love them, if that makes sense. If you really love somebody, you find out it's easy to love them. Amen? Hey, thank you for that, John, up there. The definition of love. What is the definition of love? Real love. Now, the world's version of it is, I love you if you love me. That's the world's version of it. So I had a guy, I'm not kidding you, a man brought in his 16-year-old son with his 18-year-old girlfriend. And they were sleeping together. And what they wanted me to do was marry him to make her crimes legal. She was committing a crime of statutory rape every time she slept with her 16-year-old boyfriend. What they wanted me to do was sign a piece of paper to make it legal. And I said, I'm not doing it. But I, I said, told the dad, I said, go outside, and I want to talk to the girl for a minute, and I want to talk to the boy. So I talked to the boy, and I said, let me ask you a question. I said, why are you two in bed together? Well, it's me showing that I love her. I said, you're a liar. I said, that is not you showing her how much you love her. That is you showing you how much she loves you. Because you're not giving, you're receiving. That's the way I said it to him. I said, you're not doing that for her. You're doing that for you. So I said, if she decided to cut it off, you're not going to get hurt because you can't show her your love. You're going to get hurt because she's not showing you hers. So don't give me that nonsense. And I cut right through it and I told him, I said, I'm not doing it. Okay? So, that, and that was one of those deals where, you know, we have to think about coming to church here. Don't give me that. Love. Here's the love. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave. Okay. Now, A billion Chinese people hate Jesus and want nothing to do with him. But did God send his only begotten son to die for the Chinese people? Sure he did. The Jews have hated Jesus for 2,000 years, but who did Jesus die for to begin with? The Jews. In other words, God loved all the people that have hated him and never wanted anything with as far as God is concerned to have any part of their life whatsoever and yet those are the people that God sent his only begotten son to he loved them so much that he gave his son unconditionally to people who would never accept him that's love the true meaning of love is an unconditional giving even if you don't receive back okay even if you don't receive back so 
You love husbands, you love your wives, even if you are not, if, if she is not in a state to give you any kind of love back, you still love her, and you love her unconditionally. And it's vice versa. Wives, you love your husband, even though she, he may not be in a state to where he can give any kind of love back. He's worked 10 hours, he's dead tired, and he eats supper and goes to bed. But you still love him. Okay? And that's what true love is. And it's always, and you hear me out on this, when you truly love somebody unconditionally, you can count on 100% it's going to hurt from time to time. It is going to hurt to love people unconditionally because when you decide to do that and nothing they do matters, nothing they do affects your love for them, you can count on that it's going to hurt because love always, or hurt always seems to accompany real love. I mean, think about the times that we've sinned against God who only has loved us. God has never done us wrong, ever, and yet we have offended Him by not doing what He said, and yet He still loves us. Is God ever going to stop forgiving you, Pam? No. He's, you're like Solomon. God says to us, I will be His Father and He will be my Son. Though He transgress, I will chasten him with the stripes of men, but I will never, I will never take my mercy away from him. His mercy endureth forever, the Bible says. And God loves us in that unconditional way, but we hurt him. We grieve the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we sin. It grieves God, and yet God still loves us. And when we go back to him in true repentance, because God will always bring true repentance into us, because he knows how to do it. He'll always forgive us, and he'll always continue to love us. That's, and see, that's God. God is, God's love is nearly not understandable by us because of our humanity. And yet we get it. It's just hard for us to fathom why God loves us so much when we hurt him so bad. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Where is that? Verse Romans 5, 8. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did not die for us while we were being good and being righteous. He died for us when we were at our worst. And it's usually at our worst that the Holy Spirit decides to come down right then and get us and say, I can save you from all of this. That's usually when he starts working in a person's life. Is it not? Is that not when God found you? When you were at your worst, not your best. You were at your dead worst. People say, you know, when I get my life straightened out, I'll start coming to church. Why wait? Start coming now and let God straighten out your life because he'll do it. Ephesians 5, 25, husband loves your wife even as Christ also loved the church and there it is, gave himself for it. So think of Christ and what Christ has to put up with from his church, from his body. Christ has to put up with complaining, Groaning, fussing, moaning, doing wrong. Jesus puts up with all that from his bride, and yet he's willing to do it, and he's willing to do it unconditionally. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, that Jesus won't put up with from his bride because he loves her that much. And again, the, the part, that part of us that sins and grieves the Holy Spirit, God the Father takes care of. But the bride isn't cleansing herself the husband is purifying and sanctifying the wife and he's doing it so he can present it to himself a chaste virgin. He's willing to do it because of his unconditional love. God dealt with me years into our marriage about my conditional love for my wife. God dealt with me. Mike, you love her so long as she treats you right. And I went, God, you're right. So God dealt with me one day. He said, Mike, I want you to start listening to her. Whatever she says, however she says it, I want you to listen and don't argue. And I told her that. We had an agreement. And God has blessed that. It's the reason why we're still together. Because we've had tough times. 
They've been there. But God has helped us to love one another in a way that I've just decided there isn't anything that she's going to do that's going to make me mad enough to just pop off and leave. I'm not going to do it. So when you decide to love somebody that much, you'll long suffer with them. Now, if things I don't like, I take, I take it to God and say, God, can you, can you work this in my, either fix my wife or change me so I can deal with it. Either way, you're going to be happy. Okay? Either way, that's how it's going to happen. I've decided to love this church unconditionally. And I mean everybody in it, even the people that are not here tonight. I've decided to love them unconditionally. And do not, I will not set a condition of my love to those people on how many times they visit per week. And I've heard of pastors who have, who have successfully segregated portions of his church, I mean knowingly and outwardly, telling people, now the people who come here all the time, I'm more to them than I am to the people who only show up once a week. That pastor just segregated half of his church right out. He just told them, I don't love you as much as I love these people that suck up to me all week long. Okay? And God's dealt with me about that. So, Mike, you're not going to do that. You're going to love them no matter what. God, you're right. That's the way to do it, and that's how I'll do it. And I'm just much happier that way. Okay? Doesn't matter if it's a husband, a wife, a son, or a daughter, a mother, a father, a brother, or a sister, church member, friend, neighbor. It doesn't matter. You ask God to help you love somebody unconditional, God will, God will help you because that's who he is. When you decide that you're going to give to your neighbor, when you decide you're going to give to a brother or a sister, when you decide you're going to do things for somebody and you're going to do it unconditionally, you're going to do it even if, even if there's friction between you two, you decide that you're going to be the kind of good neighbor to them that God is asking us to be. When you decide that, God will bless you and you'll just find that life is a lot easier loving people than it is being mad at them. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the gospel truth. This is what Jesus asked us to do, is to love people unconditionally and give whether we're going to expect them to give. See, if you love somebody as long as they're giving to you, that's not, that's not love enough because what if they stop giving? Does that mean you stop loving them? But the greed of this world and the greed of our flesh says, well, they're not going to do for you. Why are you going to do for them? They're not doing anything for you. They're not benefiting you, so why, do you, why should you do for them when they're not going to do for you? Well, that's called being love your neighbor. That's the commandment that we're under. And if we're not willing to be under that commandment, there is nothing else in the New Testament for you. There's not plan B of the New Testament if you decide you're not going to love everybody or at least want to love them the way God wants you to love them. There's not a plan B out of that that if you don't like that part, you can go and get this other part of the gospel. That's it. Okay, that's what he said. Brethren, Galatians 6, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. He didn't say if a man be overtaken in a fault, get him out of there. Run him off. That's not what he said. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore what's such a one in a spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Because if, a man's, if one person in this church gets overtaken in a fault, who are the rest of us? Who are the rest of us? Any one of us could be falling down the dirt road. Any one of us could fall into sin. And so if one of them did it, then it's our responsibility to love them enough to restore them to get them to confess and to restore them and not ever hold it against them ever again, considering the fact that we, it could have been us that way. Considering, it, it said, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What law? Love your neighbor as yourself, unconditionally. 1 John 2.10, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. 1 John 3, 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But what if they didn't lay down their life for us? He, that's not what he said. He did not say, do for the people in the church that do for everybody else. That's not what he said. What about old Ron that sits back there on Sunday morning from the group home? 
What does he do for this church? Does he tithe a lot? Does he pay a lot of money? And is, he, is he helping us out every week? Ron can't do a whole lot. Should we throw him out? No, we got to love him. We got to love Stacy. We got to love these other guys. We got to love these guys that we've, I've preached their funerals and I know they're in heaven right now. So when they called me and said, can we bring these guys to your church because most other churches won't let them in, I said, are you kidding me? I mean, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They said, yeah, they don't want them in there because they're afraid they'll make noise or something like that. And they said they couldn't come. I said, they're actually the ones we're supposed to have them in the front row. We're not supposed to give special seats to special people. We're supposed to let people sit anywhere they want to. And they can come in this church and leave early because I know they got a schedule to keep them on. And I know I'm going to preach after that, so it doesn't bother me that they pull out of here at 12 because those guys got to be fed at a certain time. I get that. I'm not going to hold anything against them. It ain't right. So when you start seeing people that way, that maybe some things some people can't do that you can do, you're supposed to bear that burden. That's the way it works in a marriage. I bear the burdens of my wife, but she helps bear my burdens as well. Okay? Uh, and then he said in 1 John 3, uh, verse 18, Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So if you say you're going to love somebody, you better be willing to back it up by your actions, or you're a liar. And it'll be manifest. See, the fruit will always come out, will it not? If you feign love, then you're going to produce wax fruit. That's pretty good. I just came up with that. <laughs> Amen. Wax fruit on a dead Christian. Let love be without dissimulation. I had to look that word up. It means love under false pretense, feign love, hypocrisy. I mean, we get accused of being hypocrites in church, right? Oh, you bunch of hypocrites. Well, if you say you love people, but you don't, then you are a hypocrite. So let me ask you a question. What about lost people? Do we love lost people? How does those lost people know that we love them? That's my question. Because if we haven't done anything to help them find Jesus, then can it be said? And even if it's doing nothing but praying for them, if we don't even do that, is it really true that we love lost people? We've lost ourselves. If we're not willing to pray for them, if we're not willing to in some way, whether you personally can go to them and talk to them, or if that's not your gift, and I understand that, then let me do the talking on one of these DVDs or CDs. If you say you love lost people, but you haven't done one thing for their benefit and salvation, can it really be said that it's true that you really do love them? Okay? Because love always is manifested in action. Love is giving. Did God really love us? Or did he just say, well, I gave you my only son, but he never did? then if Jesus didn't come, then God didn't love us. It's just that simple. I was going to go through 1 Corinthians 13 just in case I needed to fill in the time, but I don't. But 1 Corinthians, the, the King James Bible is right in using the word charity because it accurately conveys the idea that what is, what do we, how do we perceive charity? Charity is something you do what to? Give to them. Donate money. Okay? And so, but what if you donate and don't get a tax receipt? You didn't do it for the tax receipt. You did it to give. That's why he used the word charity, because that's the real love that he's talking about. And you go study 1 Corinthians 13 and you'll see what real giving love is. And it never waits to get something first, then give it, you give it first. And yes, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get your little heart trampled on by people. 
But I've asked God, God, out of all the people that's hurt me over the years, by saying to me, we don't want to be part of your church anymore, and that hurts. I've asked God not to let me stop loving people that come here. Even if I get trampled on again, I'm going to love everybody that God sends here until they decide they don't want to be a part of here anymore. Okay? And that hurts. It hurts bad. I cannot tell you how bad it hurts. But that's how it is. Okay? So love is always risky. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Let's stand to our feet. I love my wife, I love my children, I love my grandchildren, little brats, candy-eating brats. I love everybody in this church equally, whether they come to all the services or don't come to all the services, whether they, I don't know how much anybody gives, so I never use that as a measure of who I love and who I don't. I know some pastors, that's the first thing they look at is the tithing records, and if they don't tithe enough, then that pastor don't do anything for them. And that ain't right. That ain't right. And I have my failures in that as well. I don't think I do enough for people. And uh, I want to do more, and I want to give more. Because God has given me everything, and I did nothing to deserve it. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. God, I did you wrong on a number of occasions. And you had every right to cut me off the branch and cast me away. You had every right to. But you didn't, and that really that really surprised me. But I can't tell you how thankful I am that you did that for me. You did not love me when I was at my best. You loved me when I was at my worst. And God, I want to do that with everybody you send my way. I don't think I've attained that yet. But it's what I want to do. I want to love everybody unconditionally. And I want to give everything I can for them. For their benefit, for their blessing. Whether I get anything back out of it or not. And God, I've had enough of the... I've taken the losses over the years. And God, I don't want to stop loving people that come by here. So God, teach me how to love people more, how to give more of myself. And Father, help me to teach that to others. Let us learn from Jesus, our prime example, of dying for the sins of people that hated his guts. He died for the ones who said, crucify him, crucify him. And just like Aaron, the high priest, who bore the names of the tribes of Israel on his heart on the Day of Atonement, Jesus had every name of every Jew on his heart when he went to Calvary. And he died for a people that have despised him. And he's going to come back specifically for those same people and give them one more chance, and many of them are going to respond to it. And Father, just teach us how to love people. Help us, dear God, to abide in the Word. And we will find that all of a sudden, we're loving you more, we're loving our Bible more, and we're loving people more than we ever have in our life. We're actually becoming what you've asked us to become, and we didn't do anything for it. It's just coming out of us. Father, give us that gift. We thank you, Lord, that it is a gift. We ask you, God, Lord, to just help us love. 
manifest that fruit in our life, and we'll give you the praise for it, because that's where the praise belongs. And we pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed tonight.